Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and co-parents of all ages, this podcast is for you. Introducing in the center ring the amicable divorce expert, Judith Weigel. This is going to be an extremely interesting episode. Not that all of them aren't all extremely interesting. They really are. But with our guest today, Cammie Lehman, she's in Pennsylvania. She's a business coach. And Cammie also has her own podcast called She's Invincible. Cammie is doing this particular episode, though, as a child of divorce. And what you're going to hear from Cammie as we talk and she reflects back are some of the best lessons for any of us going forward in terms of how we, how we look back on past experiences and deal with them in the best way possible for our own health and welfare. And for that reason, Cammie, thank you for agreeing to do this interview as a child of divorce. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for the invitation. It's an honor to be able to share with you and your listeners. See, doesn't she sound positive already? I love her. And and Cammie, all this weekend, we did our pre-interview last week, and all this weekend, I kept thinking about how bubbly you were and how you took a really difficult situation that you're going to share with the audience and it just became the positive, wonderful human being you are today. So let's share with our audience what I'm talking about. So here's the first question. How old were you when your parents started the divorce process? So as far back as I can remember, I'm going to say five. So um, I was five. I have this memory of, you know, there was, must have been some sort of announcement, but I don't remember so much the words as I do the vision of what I actually observed. Which was? Which was, yeah, so I just remember that, you know, my dad had a suitcase on the end of the bed in their bedroom and he was putting things in the suitcase and either my mother said he's moving he's leaving or I drum that up by, you know, observation and just came to a conclusion. I imagine she must have said it, but I just don't remember words, but I remember that vision. And honestly, it's been with me all of my life. Do you remember being in the same room, sitting on the bed? What were you crying? Do you remember anything more? I really don't remember being in the room. I I really remember like being in the hallway and like just peering into the room from the hallway and just kind of being like almost like an out of body experience. This like looking into this room and seeing what was happening and trying to gather whatever a little five year old mind could make of this moment. How about your siblings? You mentioned you had siblings. How many and how old were they? Yeah. So I have two and uh, we're each two years apart. So my brother was seven and my sister was nine when that happened. Do you remember where they were at that time? I don't. I really don't. And that's really interesting is that I don't have any recollection of them even being in the house or, you know, at that age, they may have been out playing, but uh, I just remember being there, seeing the suitcase and knowing that he was leaving. So as an armchair therapist, and I am in no way a therapist, but when you do this work for as long as I have been doing it, you know, you tap into people's emotions and it it sounds to me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds to me that you remember this as a very singular experience. Absolutely. Yes. And and it was, it was very, uh, it was a defining moment, I would say. That, that really, yeah, it really did mark a lot of the course of my life. At five years old, Cammie, why did they get divorced? My father was an alcoholic and he was, uh, he was a really hard worker and a very smart man, but he loved to drink and he would drink until he was stupid. And, uh, and, and to, he would honestly, he almost killed himself several times, 
uh, in his car on his way home from wherever he was drinking. And uh, he just wouldn't quit. And he became violent and abusive to my mother, never to us kids that I have any memory of, but to my mother. And I, I think the last draw was the last draw. Did you actually see him hit your mother? No, I never saw that. And I'm so grateful for that. So it was maybe behind closed doors in their bedroom or yeah. you weren't around? I was not. It, it never happened in front of me. I've never seen that. I have seen him be angry, even not so much at five, but over the years of the span of his life, I have seen how angry he can be and heard stories, but I never saw, never saw him do that. Thank God, because, you know, that's an indelible imprint on our memories that is defining, and it's so hard for it to go away, and it, it just, it, it puts fear inside of the kids for the rest of their lives and, and really shapes the relationships they have going forward. So I'm so happy you were spared that. Now, here's the question that really starts defining things even more, and that is, was alcoholism pervasive in your father's family and or in your mother's family? Yeah, so the answer is yes, and it's not, it's not a short answer. So my father's father was from Germany, straight from the boat. And, you know, I had a conversation with someone else about this earlier this morning, and it's so interesting. But, you know, in other countries, they do things different. So in other countries, a lot of times they'll have alcohol with every meal. And they might even have it, beer in Germany, for breakfast. So what happened, I think, is that then my grandfather came to the United States, and all of a sudden he's tagged an alcoholic because he's doing what he was doing in Germany, which was normal, right, for being in Germany uh, and not acceptable here in the United States, right? Yep. So I remember many times that I would be with my grandmother and have a sleepover and she would make this beautiful breakfast and put it on the table and he would push the plate aside and crack open a beer. Um, he... You know, and he, he, like, that's what he did. He watched TV, smoked cigars, and drink beer, read the newspaper. Like, it was like the four step process of life back then. And then my dad did the same. So my dad uh, became, he, he grew up in that. That was normal to him. And he continued that pattern on. And so, yes, for his side, absolutely. My mother's side, on the other hand, I don't believe that any of the parents, her parents had a problem, but three, two, at least two for sure of her sisters uh, had problems with alcohol and addiction. But you were telling me about um, another life-defining event for your mother where alcohol was part of it and she lost her mom? Is she did. She so, yeah. So when she was 16 years old, she, uh, of course, lived at home with her mom and her mom's husband. So I guess we would call him stepdad. And um, they were on their way to her, my mother's friend's house to bring my mother some things so she could stay overnight. And a drunk driver went through a stop sign and killed my, would be my grandmother um, instantly. And my mom was just 16 years old. Did your mother blame herself in any way? You know, not initially she didn't, but just recently over the past few years, she has talked about it more, I think, as she's aging. And she, I think that she does. I think that she um, does have some guilt around that and also fear of like how you live your life, what you say to people, because it might be the last time you ever talk to them or see them. And so she's living in that right now. The pandemic, if it's taught me anything, has taught me how precious each second is because my memory is March 16th of last year changed everything. That's my memory of when we were told in California 
safer at home. Life is going to change. We don't know when it's going to revert back to what we know. And I just, you know, and my mom died in the process of COVID. She didn't get COVID. She was 97. So she lived her life. But, you know, we had what everybody has to do when they know their parent is in their last few months, and that is you visit with them. Well, that became very creative. So yes, for your mom and life, def- every moment could be the last. But you know, Cammy, I had a client who still to this day blames himself for rescheduling a dinner many, many years ago with his parents and the parents coming to dinner the ne- on the rescheduled night got killed by a drunk driver. He still blames himself to this day. This was 20, 30 years ago. So these yeah. things are not easily dealt with, and they may not be dealt with at the time, and they come up later in life. Yes, I do, I do believe that. I think the closer you get to the end of your own life or the deeper you get in reflection of different times and things you go through, like COVID is one of those things, right? That it's bringing people to a new awareness and they're thinking different and they're doing things differently because they know better now. And so I think that just brought that to the forefront. And I do believe that we we are defined, unfortunately, by some of these tragic events. That just come up, that we didn't create. They just come up. They're part of life and um, not how you have to deal with them. Okay. So dad leaves. Now dad leaves. Dad leaves. Now there's mom and the three children, five, seven, and nine. What was life like inside that home? And then we're going to go to what the co-parenting was like. But what was life like now for the four of you? Yeah. So the only thing I remember is that I hardly ever saw my mom again. It was like my dad left and then my mom went into this work mode, like, like crazy (laughs) that she had a bunch of different jobs. I know of at least three of them that she had and she worked all the time. We, we hardly saw her. Kimmy, was she working prior to your dad leaving? I don't, I don't remember that. And I can't really say yes or no for sure, but I, I don't think so. I think that she was home with the three kids when we were young. So I don't know if she ever talked to you about the divorce settlement or, you know, agreement years later at five and even seven, you don't really understand anything like this, but were there any assets to divide? Was there any alimony or child support as far as you know? Yeah. So that was a very interesting thing is, and I don't know what the laws were back then. So I can't really speak to that. I mean, that would have been right around 1968 or 69. But I do remember that my dad never gave her money. I remember we never had enough money. And um, she just worked and worked and worked. There, We did live in a house in New Jersey that at one point when I was in high school, she had to sell. And I think she needed to sell it. And I don't know if she had to share it with him or if if that was part of what her asset was and she took it with her, but we did need to sell the house. I, I find it fascinating that she had to work so many jobs. My guess is, to be honest with you, there were no real assets to divide and more than likely there was no money and it doesn't sound like she fought it either. It's kind of, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, it kind of sounds like she just accepted that there wasn't going to be a marriage any longer, and she just went ahead redefining her life. Do do you think that's accurate? I somewhat. I do think that she did try to fight it, but I also know like in order to do that, there has to be money to pay attorneys and go to court, and there wasn't that. Like If you have to decide between feeding your kids or going to court, you're just going to do what you have to do to feed your kids. So I think there was a lot of fires being put out and a lot of quick decisions in the moment of what do I need to do right now to make this work? And I think that's really how it went. Sounds like your mom's a really strong person, Cammy, to be able to just get up and do that. Yes, she still is too, even still today. 
Please share with our audience what it was like, though, in the house when mom is at work all the time. Who took care of who? Five, seven, and nine. A year goes by, six, eight, and ten. We're still talking about three very young children. What was, who parented you? I I think in the very beginning, I think my sister was maybe supposed to be in charge, but ultimately we all pretty much parented ourselves. We were, we all had to like fend for ourselves. Um, you know, and my brother was like the normal brother. He would hang up the phone on me, tell my friends I wasn't home. Uh, if they came to the door, like he did the ornery things. I, I remember only one time that we got into like a really big fight where I got hurt. But other than that, um, and then I was the one that was always blamed. I was the little one. So I wasn't yet doing things that were really wrong. And so they used me as their scapegoat. So, and yeah, so I got, and they, they used to always say that I was my mom's favorite. And so they would just use me and, and then make blame everything on me. Um, yeah, I don't think they ever realized that I, if I was ever a favorite, it was because I was the most well behaved and I learned everything from them, what not to do, right? Do you feel that this, in a very positive way, shaped the person you are now? Business Absolutely. Host, podcast host. We'll talk about your own marriage and kids in, in a little bit, but a positive human being. Did you grow? Did you grow up? I guess you grew up quickly. Yes, very quickly and very independent. You know, like I remember getting on my bike and going down to the lake, which was a, a little distance, maybe a mile. I'd ride my bike as like a young kid. Um, we, we would go fishing. We would go to the lake and go swimming. I remember working in a snack bar at the lake and I might have been 11 and, and having a job. Like it was just a fun neighborhood job, but even still I'd ride my bike there and I'd work in the snack bar and sell the candy and whatever. And, um, it's just, it's just interesting. Right. So I really was, uh, on my own a lot. Who helped you with homework? I don't think that I had any help with homework. I think we did back then now. I mean, it's a while ago. I think probably most of the work was done in the classroom and there was less of that divvied out. You know, homework today is like another full-time day at school. It wasn't like that then. So, But I don't remember that I ever really had anybody help me with homework. And how about dressing? How about going shopping to buy clothes? Yeah. So that was my grandmom. That was my father's mother, who I would say I was closest to my entire life. Uh, But it was very short. She passed away when I was 14. So, um, but she used to take me, she'd come pick me up and she lived about a little over an hour from where we lived. And she would come pick me up and I would stay overnight and she would just take me around town and she'd take me downtown and she'd buy me clothes and take me to visit all her friends and make me food. And she was so amazing. Like if I could say I miss anybody in my life, that's the one that I would say had the biggest positive impact on me. And I can honestly tell you that I think I stepped into her greatness when I grew up and had a family because I modeled so much of what she did and who she was. And I remember before my dad passed away, he said, you remind me so much of your grandma. So, I mean, that was a compliment to me. And yes, I know. And we didn't even talk about this. This is just all coming out. Yeah, but that that actually happened. These, these interviews can be very therapeutic. When I'm talking to children of divorce and when I'm talking to people, adults who have gone through divorce, just having that space and time for somebody to ask you questions and to reflect, I think it's really positive. So yes, I'm glad you I feel do. that way too. <laughs> yes, and it's good memories. You know, it's bringing up the good things and not focusing so much on the negative things. And she really did um, make, she filled in for what my dad didn't step up and do. Uh, she really did close the gap there. Well, what about your two siblings? Did, did your uh, paternal grandmother take care of them or more so you than them? You know, it's interesting, but I don't remember. She, if she took them, we all worked individually. Like none of us went together uh, to visit her. So 
And it's so funny because I do that. I've done that with my kids. We have, we call them secret lunches and I would just take one and we would have our own thing. And, um, and now I get to spend that kind of time with my grandkids, but that was, she really molded that. So if they went with her, I really don't remember, but it would have been individually. So she may have on off times. Yeah. So Cammy, what was the co-parenting relationship like between your parents? Yeah, that was not good. My dad, he uh, he traveled a lot. He worked in other states. And at one point he went to um, Abu Dhabi and worked there and did water testing. He was an underwater well driller. Uh, he had gone to Drexel University. And so he started his own company in New York and he dug wells and tested water and just went to other countries and dug wells there, made sure they had safe drinking water and things like that. So we didn't see him a lot. He would send um, money and gifts, like around the holidays, we would get a check or, or you know, gifts. Um, I remember many times that he had made arrangements to come pick us up and then he didn't show up. Like that, of course, is one of my, you know, stabbing moments where it was like that, that never went away. Um, but I feel that in my gut is that the time sitting on the front steps, like, you know, watching and every car go by and it wasn't him and it wasn't him. And then the day was over and he didn't come. And I remember my mom really giving him a hard time. I remember, and I don't, I think it was over the phone that I heard a conversation with, you know, that she was like, you can't do this. So, um, I think honestly that their relationship was so toxic that it was easier for him to stay away from us than to have to deal with her. And that was hard. I understand. Um, I understand uh, how somebody can be so fearful to pick up their kids because of the toxicity of the relationship, but, 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 and then just to put, myself in the position of the children waiting. I mean, we've seen movies about this, but now I'm talking to a human being that actually experienced this. Um, this is where this, your attitude, your philosophy on life gets even more stellar. So this is what you accepted, um, a, tox a toxic co-parenting relationship, therefore, an absence of dad, mom had to seriously put pedal to the metal and work so that she could provide for her children. And she apparently did a good job because here you are very successful. But here's what I want you to share with our, our listeners. As everybody became older, you're now a young adult, you're having your own life you're getting married and having children. You've been married, what, Cammie, 32 years with two adults? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So 32 years this year. So June, it'll be 32 years. You have two children and how many grandchildren? Yes. And I have, uh, and I also have another child that came from my husband from a different time. So uh -huh. I want to make sure. Yeah. So, Love and we, family. yeah. And together we have eight grandchildren. It's wonderful, wonderful. It is amazing. Your dad gets sick, so we now so so now we've laid the groundwork for not a huge relationship with dad, but now your dad gets sick. Please explain what you did in response to your dad's needs. Yeah. So well, he got sick twice. So the first time he got sick, he uh, he got throat diagnosed with throat cancer. And he had like a 16 hour surgery. They didn't expect him to live long. He had a complete laryngectomy. He had an artificial voice box. It was a lot and it was uh, very intense. And so that was the first time. And they, they did the surgery. He came out of that. He recovered. They expected him to maybe live three years, but they didn't think this would be a long term situation. And then 10 years later, he was diagnosed again. Uh, and he had, it was totally different, not related in any way. 
He was diagnosed with a type of lung cancer that had gone to his brain. So he didn't really actually, wasn't suffering from tumors in his lungs, but it was a lung cancer that went to his brain. So that was pretty quick, about seven or eight months from the time he was diagnosed until the time he passed away. He, did you say when we did our pre-interview that he was married at the time? He was divorced. No, he was, he was divorced for the third time for at the, that point. Ah, for the third time. For the third time. So how, what was your role in his last months or year? Yeah, so um, I took care of him for the most part. My sister came in, but she lives in California. So she would come from time to time for a few days, uh, but I had to go there and I would make trips to New York sometimes several times a week. I would go, I would stay at his house, which I had never been to. He was the kind of dad, he sent me a birthday card and said, my new address is, and he would have his new address in the card. I didn't know he was moving or he was getting a new house or anything. I would just get, oh, happy birthday. And here's my new address. <laughs> I guess, you know, it's like uh, forwarding your mail at the post office. But um, so I hadn't even been to his home and I had to go there, stay by myself. It was kind of scary. I mean, it was such a beautiful place on a mountain, but it was initially very frightening to like find out this is what's going on with your dad. And now he's having all these surgeries and you got to stay there and be in a strange place by yourself and you don't know anybody and you don't know where to go. Like I knew nothing. I didn't even know where a grocery store was. Uh, and I spent a lot of time doing that. And uh, going to doctor's appointments and hospitals. And eventually I um, had him admitted to a veteran's home in New York, in Oxford, which was absolutely amazing. And um, and then it was from there back and forth to the hospital from the veteran's home. And then he, he did finally pass away at the veteran's home. But why? Why did you do all that? Why did you do all that? <laughs> and how could you bring yourself to do all that given that you really didn't have a huge relationship with your father since you were five. I know. I, you know, I, I, in the moment, I never questioned why it was later. It was after I did it all and, and realized what I had sacrificed that then I was kind of upset. I was pretty mad. Like I had to do this. And um, all I can say is, you know, I gave him a gift of unconditional love. I gave him everything that he did was not willing to give me and my siblings, but I did that and I made a sacrifice. But in the end, I feel like I had that time with him also, like this, this could go good. Uh, I did have that time with him by myself to really get to know who he was. So that was that was a gift in the end, but I still made a huge sacrifice. My son was a senior in high school. Literally, I missed most of his senior year. My dad passed in February and my son graduated in June. So I missed a lot of it. And I just remember, I think the realization was sitting at the graduation and the, you know, the pomp and circumstance starts playing and the doors open and the students come marching down the aisle to the to their seats with their hats and their caps and gowns. And it was in that moment, I lost it, like literally lost it. And just like a blubbering idiot. I think it was in that moment that I realized what sacrifice I made. Oh my God. I have to catch my breath on that because I can understand. I can understand that emotion. I can understand how that moment took over and the realization of being a part of every step of that last year of your son's life. How was your son with you and your decision to take care of your dad while he was in high school or that last year? Yeah. So, so the last year you had said of my son's life, my, it was the last year of my dad's life and the last year of my son's high school. And he was very understanding. He, you know, I would have taken him with me if I could, but he had to be here for school. Um, so I couldn't, 
Uh, but he was very understanding. And I remember that. And it wasn't easy. He had just gotten his driver's license and he, you know, he didn't have a car. And so when I was here, he would use my car, but then I would take the car and leave. And, you know, my husband worked. So, you know, it just was very difficult. And I, like I said, I didn't realize that until, until those doors open and those students came with their caps and gowns. And I just, it just, brushed over me like, oh my gosh, you really sacrificed. Do you regret and I did. Do you regret it? How how have you now put that to bed and processed? Yeah, I don't I can't say I regret it because I do still think I did the right thing, even though like in my with my morals and values, I still feel like I did the right thing. I gave him a gift that he didn't deserve, that he wasn't willing to give to us, but I, I gave him that. Um, if I had to do it again, I may have not spent as much time there. I may have managed some of it from home more than being away. Um, but I, I think what I did was I, um, I really made up for it in a sense of when it was over and I was back at home to really have that time with my son and, um, and just over the years of him going to college and then going to grad school and he's a, he's a doctor now. Um, so yeah, so we don't, it doesn't come up a lot and he's so cool because he's really interested in like the heritage and the lineage and all of that. So he's, you know, really like researching our German ancestors and like really trying to see where he comes from and all of that. So I'm just so grateful. Do you, I'm, first of all, I'm so happy that he's not, um, uh, angry, uh, about that and that he's understanding and you have a close relationship. I, I'm happy for you and for him with that because these are tough decisions, Cami. These are really tough decisions. Um, I mean, we even went through this when my mom was uh, really, pa- uh, you know, going through the passing process last year. My sister lived in Pittsburgh. That's where I'm from. My sister, we grew up in Pittsburgh. So she was the only child that was living there with her own children and her own grandchildren. And you want to see your grandchildren as that, you know, from years one through five, my God, you don't want to miss those years. But then mom was in need and I'm here in California as my brother was too. And we just all pitched in and helped. I don't think you had that same experience with your two siblings, did you? Not in the final times, no. Um, I think my sister was in denial. She would say things like, maybe he has the flu or, you know, different things like that that were just, that didn't even make sense. And my brother, um, he only came one time. There was one time in the summer that our family had a vacation planned. And I said, you have to come. My, he had just, my dad had just had surgery. He was still in the hospital. And I was like, I am still going to take this vacation. This was very early on. He had just been diagnosed and he had just had brain surgery. And I said, I knew like something inside said, you better do whatever you can do right now because the next, you don't know what's going to happen. And it was true because that was August. And then he, he, he went through all this until uh, February. So it was like six more months of that. So they didn't help a lot. Um, my sister would call and bark orders from a distance. Uh, that, you know, that was really what it was. She did, like I said, she came several times in early on, but I think Thanksgiving might have been, or Christmas, maybe she came Christmas and then that was it. And then she didn't come. And so there was a few more months after that. And I was the one that did it all. What about your brother? He only came that one time in, uh, in August. And that was it. And my da- I don't think my dad even knew who he was when he came. I think he was still pretty much out of it from the surgery and hadn't seen my brother in so many years that I don't think he really knew who he was. And I think my brother, that was probably all my brother could handle. I think he felt like, why should I go if he doesn't even know who I am? How, has, how did your dad's death change or not change your relationship with your siblings? Um, it didn't change anything. I don't think we were, we were never really close. Uh, we're still not close. If anything, my sister and I are further apart because you know, she, 
watch just who she is. <laughs> So it's not even, that's a whole other talk. <laughs> All right. All right. So looking back, now that you're an adult, looking back, would you have liked or envisioned that your parents maybe could have gotten counseling? Maybe in those days, we just didn't run to the therapist. It's only recently we are started going to therapists, but I know I was born in 52 Nobody went to a therapist. And mind you, every woman on my block in my neighborhood raising kids in the 50s needed to go to a therapist. They stuffed hopes and dreams and did what they thought they were supposed to do. And there was alcoholism and Valium started being used. And it was all this craziness. So looking back, even though you're you're younger than I am, um, do you wish even now that your parents would have tried to stay together? Or do you think they made the right decision? If you're asking the five-year-old girl, <laughs> I wish they had stayed together. Uh, asking me now today, honestly, yes, I still say I would have wished that they could have, but it wasn't possible. You know, you are never going to fix an alcoholic or someone who's addicted to anything. They have to first admit and right and do their own work on, okay, maybe there is a problem here. Maybe I need to go figure this out, uh, get help, and then heal from that, right? And overcome those addictions. And that was not something that he was, a, you know, would have done. And between pride and, you know, the, his upbringing. I mean, that's what his father did. So how could it be wrong, right? Because his father was his hero in his mind and he was just doing what he, what the hero was doing. So there's so much that goes with that when this comes like generationally that, yes, do I wish he could have gotten help? Do I wish he could have given up that addiction? Absolutely, 100%. Uh, realistically, that wasn't happening. So, and no, I would never want my mother to be in a relationship with anyone who was abusing her, whether it's verbal, physical, th- like nothing, emotional, none of that. So um, I don't see that this would ever work. And I mean, you know, with that being said, like sometimes divorce is unavoidable. It is, it, it can be. And I know we're like talking about the amicable divorce. This isn't very amicable, but we, sometimes we have to be realistic. I really believe there are times when there's differences or people are growing apart or they're losing their passion. Like I get it. It's hard. Like I've been married almost 32 years. It's hard, but it's harder. I think to be divorced, it's harder for the parents. It's harder for the children. It's harder for relationships it's harder financially, right? I mean, I can give you all the ways that it's hard. Um, And if it can be worked out, I think that's great. But in this situation and many others, it can't. It's, I mean, if it comes down to like, it's your life, you could be hurt, killed, whatever. Like, no, that's ridiculous. And there are times when that happens. Yes, there are. Yes, there are. So, all right. How did... The way you grew up in a single parent household with very little contact with your dad, and our dads are our male role models, right? As we grow up and we start dating, how did you start defining the men you wanted in your life when you started dating as an adult? And apparently you found that person with a 32-year-old marriage, but how did you start looking at men to bring in your life now when you were an adult? Yeah, so I wasn't an adult uh, when I met my husband in high school. So I was a freshman and he was a senior and that's how we met. So I was, I never got to like the adult place where I was selecting or dating or having relationships. Uh, We started dating and um, I actually was a teenage pregnant teenager. Yeah. So that was very interesting. That happened. Uh, And I would say, you know, that's the mic drop. That's how we handled it. Uh, My husband also came from his family. His parents were divorced as well. And he's one of nine children. So that was pretty crazy too. And I think I just found I think we find, we find that, right? We end up finding things that are alike and that's what happened. And I think that we kind of understood each other. Uh, We could sympathize and empathize with each other. 
because we had both been through it and we're living that life. And um, yeah, and we clung to each other. That's what I would say. We clung to each other. Um, I ended up pregnant. Um, we split up for three years, three, about three, three and a half years. Um, he went his way. I went my way, had a baby. And then about four years later, uh, we got back together. How? So, How did you get back together? Yeah. So I contacted his father to let him know. I don't know. I must have been feeling nostalgic or something. I contacted his father to say, hey, you know, I don't know if you know this, but you have a granddaughter and, you know, we live close to each other. And I don't know if that means anything to you, but if you want to meet her or, you know, whatever, um, I'm, ha- I'm okay with that. And he contacted his son and was like, oh my gosh, blah, blah, blah. And then he came and found me. So it wasn't my intention by any means. I was really just, it was that part of me that was trying to create the relationship, right? That for my child, because it was what I didn't have. And so I didn't feel like I could do it with her father, but I didn't even, yeah, it, he was young and crazy then, but, um, but I thought, well, maybe her, his dad would want to be a grandpa. Right. And so I reached out to him with that in mind. And then he went and called his son and then he came and found me and they, you know, but I make it sound easy. It wasn't easy. Oh my gosh. It wasn't easy. It really wasn't. Did you didn't reconnect immediately? It wasn't like two souls coming back together again. No, well, I didn't have any trust, right? Because we had already split up and I went off and had this baby by myself. And so I felt abandoned again, right? So talk about abandonment issues. Uh, You know, I got that with my dad. Then I had that with this relationship. Now I'm having this baby on my own. Um, So I didn't, there was no trust. And so I was like, oh no, you're not even going to meet her until we see where this is going. Because I would rather never have her know you than know you and then go out of her life again, because I knew what that looked like. And I wasn't willing to have that for my child. And so, yeah, so there was a while of, you know, just trying to figure things out and dating and, uh, those things really first before we were really sure. And even when we thought we were really sure, we weren't really sure. We got back together and we split up again. <laughs> there were still things. Yeah, I mean, it was hard. It was hard, but we finally got married when she was nine. So um, she was turning nine and we finally were like, we're going to do this. And so we did. And so we've been married since then. She's 40. What made it right at that time? I just think we were older. I feel like he had done, I, I just felt like he had done everything he was going to do. And it, I didn't think he was, I thought he was kind of done. I thought, okay, he's sown his oats. He's, he's more mature. He was 28 by then. I'm like, if you're not going to be ready now, you're never going to be. I personally didn't want to get married. I was very happy. Like, let's just live together. But he kept asking me and asking me and I said no for a really long time. And then finally one day I just said, okay. And I think initially I was doing it because of her, because of my daughter, because I wanted that for her. I didn't want her to be raised like I was. I didn't want her to grow up with those issues that, that I grew up with and, and that dysfunction and all of that. And so initially I think I gave in and said yes uh, for her, but it was amazing. And it's been, it's been amazing. So you really can work on relationships. That phrase, work on relationships, was always a difficult one for me to process. But I don't know why, because I worked on my relationship with my mother, and I'm happy that it turned out as good as it could be at the time of her death. So you've expressed a couple things that fascinate me, and they came out, what I'm going to say came out in an interview we posted on the 21st of April, and it was with this woman, Anastasia Mahanova, who's a social psychologist, and she did a research project 
on 71 couples in the first three years of their life and found that we have chromosomes. Each one of us have chromosomes and there's a little p- portion of our DNA. Well, we know we have chromosomes. There's a little portion of the, uh, the chromosomal makeup in each one of us uh, for our DNA, we are either coded to be able to have lasting relationships or to have a difficult time having lasting relationships. And as I was talking to you and as I'm listening to you bring up a few, a few more new things in this conversation than before, which I love, I'm wondering if you have the perfect type of CC chromosome, which is the type of chromosome as opposed to AA. So there's three types. There's CC, AC, and AA. If you have CC coded, you have the right foundation to have trust, gratitude, and forgiveness as part of your makeup, which allows you to create lasting relationships. Still doesn't mean it's totally easy, but it sets you up with the ability to have that. The people who get divorced in their first, second, and third marriages, because I get repeat business, we do get remarried, right? I'm thinking they should get their chromosomes tested. You may have AA, which is the hardest setup. So you, you talked about a couple things. You talked about trust just now. And you talked about unconditional love for your dad. Cammie, to have unconditional love for anyone other than a child or a pet is really hard. And you had it with your dad, which shows me that there's no age limit to wanting to connect with a parent. Now that you're a parent, do you feel that way? Is that a true statement? Yeah, I do. I do think, here's the thing, you know, there's a lot of dysfunction. You know, I don't believe that you should, I think you should have boundaries. I don't believe that you should have relationships with people just because you're related to them. If you don't share the same morals and values, if you don't, um, uh, you know, if they're causing grief in your life, if they're totally dysfunctional, if they're not within, you know, your boundaries, whatever they are, like, I don't believe that you get a ticket just because you're related, that, that you should take a certain behavior from your mom or your dad or your sister or brother because they're your blood relatives. I am much closer to some of my dearest friends than I am my own blood relatives and I'm okay with that. So back to your question, um, I, I just believe that you, you know, there's for me and for, for my dad, I felt that I could give that to him. That was a gift I wanted to give. Um, I don't give that to everyone, right? It's not like that's not who I am, but that's who I am in that relationship. And I am so grateful. I, you know, when I look at him, I, what I see is that if it wasn't for him, that I wouldn't even be here today. And if, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have the kids and the relationship and the grandkids this would be totally different. And so for that reason, I was able to overlook all of those things and be able to love him unconditionally until the end. And I knew it wasn't forever, right? Like the, I knew the end was coming. If you said to me, you need to do this for a hundred years, I'm telling you right now, I couldn't have, but I knew it was coming and I needed to work through that process without any regrets and really just look at it as a gift and know that my life was the gift he gave me and this was a way that I could give back. You gave yourself the gift back. You realize that, right? I did, yeah. But I did for him too, but I did for me. Yeah, Yeah. because no one else can say they were there till the end. Like, you know, they just, they weren't, so. So you have forgiveness as part of your makeup. Um, Trust. What is the trust like in your relationship with your husband? Yeah, so that's that's always been a little sketchy too because um, you know we got off to a rocky start. Uh, then we you know get together and then more things happen. So there there has always been this element of that, and we continue to always work through that. And I think you know you need to give grace to people. I really think that 
you know, we really are shaped by our experiences, right? So when, when someone does something mistrusting, then that creates this, you know, mistrust in you. And then you look at other people that way, right? Not necessarily the one who did it, right? But if you're, if you have abandoned, you know, abandonment issues, or you have issues with trust, you know, you're constantly looking at people like, I don't know, should I trust you? So, you know, you always get off to that start. Uh, but I do think you can work through them. And it's, you know, it, when I say, you know, we're going on 32 years, it, it, it's, it's work. It's work every day. <laughs> every single day. They never stop being work. Um, but yeah, this is what we committed to. And I think we can hear in your voice that you have gratitude. You, you really struck me when I first spoke with you as somebody who's very appreciative for what they have, albeit you worked for everything you have, but you do sound like a very grateful person to me. Do, do, you, do you feel that way? Is that how you live? I do. I live in gratitude. I through everything. And some days you wouldn't, if you saw me, you'd be like, no, she's not looking like she's living in gratitude right now. But I, I, I am centered in gratitude and I'm grateful for every opportunity, every relationship, every encounter, every experience. You know, that's what my podcast is about. It's about being grateful for the good, the bad, and the ugly, because it's in the ugly and the bad that shapes us and molds us and defines us, but it also prepares us for wherever we're going next. And I really believe that I've been uh, really prepared uh, for so many things, but it, it's been through the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I'm grateful for every bit of it. And especially even to you today to be able to share this story that there may be a listener out there today who maybe has a child struggling with these things, or maybe they themselves, like as a business coach, I work with women who have these issues and this is what holds them back. This is what causes them to sabotage their efforts and their success. And that as they work through these things, they really can step into the greatest version of themselves. But it's these, these issues, these things from the past, these negative experiences that will hold you back. And until you really, you know, see them for what they are, find a way to overcome them in, in any way that they're holding you back and get on with your life because your life is short too. And you get to choose if you want to stay in that hole or if you want to step into your greatness and really live the best life that you could. Well, I certainly know this to be true since I have listened to your podcast and you open with this. This is exactly how you open each episode. The good, the bad, and the ugly. You got to push through it. Your heart has to be in the right place. And then the people that you interview share their stories with the world. Yes, we are delivering hope to the world no matter where you are in your life or your business that you can get back up. And you can chase your dreams. And the only way you won't get them is if you stay down. You just have to get back up every single time. How long have you been a business coach? And how long have you had the podcast? Yeah, so I've been a business coach for 27 years. And I've had the podcast for just over one year. So we just It's celebrated. trending like crazy everywhere around the world, isn't it? It is, yes, and I'm so grateful for that. So we're we're uh, rating very high on the, the charts uh, in Pakistan, uh, Canada, all global, through the U.S. Uh, in entrepreneurship and business, and I'm just so grateful uh, for just you know again like shaking off the stuff and believing in yourself. Like I had to go through that as I created that podcast. And um, just stepping into the greatness. But when you answer to the calling on your life, I had no idea. We launched the podcast 11 days before the world shut down from the pandemic. And if I had not answered yes to that calling, then I would not have that platform in place and launched 11 days ahead when the world was going to need more positive messages and that women were going to have to leave their jobs and go home and become homeschool teachers to their children. And I have never been so grateful for that experience and that decision to say yes and even push through because even that wasn't easy to launch a top podcast. But 
I pushed through all the obstacles and I was able to do that. And really from a grateful heart, I, I just can't tell you enough. Um, just, it's just been amazing. Timing being everything, podcasts have proliferated since March 16th, the, the recognizable day of the pandemic in the United States. What was the calling? How, how did that happen that you felt you needed to do this? Yeah. So I was um, working my business. I was looking for ways to market my business. I was going to um, build a webinar. So I went to, I, I joined a class uh, at the end of 2019. It was like a six week course on building webinars. And I, I hated it. I hate, I just didn't feel right. It was so <laughs> difficult for me. And I said to the girl who was teaching it, like, I hate this. And she knew it, but it, we were pushing through because that's what we do. Right. And so then she knew that I wanted to have a podcast. She had one. And when we had connected, I said, I would eventually like to do that. And, you know, really my ultimate goal was to have a talk show, like, like think Ellen DeGeneres talk show, you know, team up with Cheerios, go around the world and bless families with dollars and cars and gifts and money, all the stuff. Uh, but, you know, having a podcast was one of those steps. And so she came to me and she said, you know, the school that I went to is launching another program. And I know you really want to do this. And I think you should. And I think that the webinar will be easier for you after you go through this podcast process. And I was like, okay. So I abandoned the webinar and I jumped into this class and I went through this program. It was every day. I mean, literally I hardly ate. I hardly slept. I worked every day. I'm not techie. I didn't know anything about anything. And I learned everything that I needed to know. And after 28 days, I launched that podcast and it ranked number 42 on the iTunes list for entrepreneurship and business. And um, I learned it all and had such a fun time. It actually took me to my next thing. And now I'm helping others launch top podcasts on iTunes as well. So I just had two launch last week. One hit number 59 and the other one hit number 36. And they're ranking all over the world and it's just been amazing. But it was, you know, it's in those times where you have to get back up. And, um, you know, I'm finishing a book and I got really stuck. And when I launched that podcast, I realized in that moment that this was the final chapter of my book that I couldn't write because I hadn't yet lived it. So coming out later this year is going to be the, fi you know, the final part of this book and we'll get that out into the world and that's going to be amazing as well. But, you know, you just go, you have to trust yourself. Like if you can't trust anyone else, you have to trust yourself. You really do know the answers and you really do have everything within you that you need to move forward, but you're not trusting yourself enough to say yes. And I just, my word last year, you know, people sometimes get like, they'll do like a word for the year and that'll be like their word. My word was yes. And I, I just wanted to make a practice to say yes, because I used to overthink things all the time and I would talk myself in and out of things. And I look back and think how many opportunities were, were in front of me that I didn't, didn't take because I wasn't sure and didn't trust myself. But, you know, today, after all of that, I would say, oh my gosh, if you can't trust anybody in the world, you trust yourself and you trust the process and say yes, practice saying yes and go find out what you love, what you don't, where your next move is, where you should be and what you should be doing in the world because you're actually here for something specific that only you can do. And every time you say no, you're not, you're not doing that thing. The, the one thing that you're here to do. Boy, I, ca I cannot agree with you more. I think that's some of the best advice I have ever heard. You must trust yourself. You can't look to the left or right. Anna Winter, Anna Winter the uh, editor of Vogue, she has a masterclass out. And on Instagram, she's advertised. She said exactly what you just said. She said, if you look to the left of you and the right of you and you compare yourself to other people, you will miss your intrinsic value that only you have to give to the world. Well, I don't know her and I've never heard of that. I know about well, you know Vogue magazine. <laughs> but I'm going to look that up because we're on the same wavelength here. But yeah, that's, that's really what I did and that's how I feel. And that's the best advice I could give to anyone right now, no matter where you are. And just remember 
like tough times don't last, but tough people do. And whatever you're going through right now, you, you just keep going. Have you ever heard someone say, if you're going through hell, just keep going no matter what, because one day you're going to look back. And while it seems like the worst thing ever right now in six months or a year or two years, you're going to look back and be so grateful because you'll find that that hard time was the time that you had to go through to prepare you for the greatest thing that you're about to do in your life. And with that, you have just lived as an example for your business coach clients. You just launched a business in front of your clients that come to you as a business coach. Have you thought about that? I have not, but thank you for bringing that to my attention. That's exactly what you just did. And tough times don't last, but tough people do. I mean, how inspirational is that? You have given so many things and just say yes. Just say yes. Lisa Renna, listen, my guilty pleasure is watching Bravo reality shows. Lisa Renna on the Beverly Hills Housewife. But we know Lisa Renna from, she's an actress and she's on uh, Home Shopping Network. And she says, you just say yes. You just say yes, and then you do the best you can. You just say yes. And so here you are, highly successful, launching a killer. I mean, she's invincible. What a title. So, Cami, this is where you get to tell people how to reach you, not only as a business coach, but to, to have you help them launch their own podcast. How do people get in touch with you? Yes. Yeah, so just go to my website. It's camilehman.com. That's it. Uh, but just go there. Everything, every way to reach me, everything that I do or support or in, involved with is right there. So camilehman.com. And of course, this She's Invincible podcast, you can find that on iTunes and anywhere else where podcasts are listened to. You can just Google it because that's all I did. And it was easy. It just came up. It was wonderful. And then, you know, your episodes were accessible. I loved it. Thank you so much for taking time out to share your story with our listeners. I know that you have helped many people listening to the show. Thank you, Cammie. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I appreciate it so much. It's been so great to be with you today. And it's been so great to be with all of you as well. So please subscribe if you have not to this podcast. Please share it with your friends. You can reach me through my website, theamicabledivorceexpert.com. And as always, have an amicable day. Talk to you next week. That's our show for today. Thank you for joining us. Be good to yourselves, be kind to your spouse, and cherish your children above all else. 